Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ESU Happy Hour. Today's presentation is about port wines with Dr. Phil Williams. My name is Dr. Karen Blair Brand, and I am the committee chair for the ESU Happy Hour Committee and president of the ESU Central Pennsylvania branch. I would like to give you a big thank you uh, to the ESU Charlottesville branch for sponsoring today's happy hour. Ideas for our happy hour lectures uh, basically come from ESU members and viewers like you. At the end of the program, you will receive a survey in your email where you are encouraged to share your feedback on tonight's program uh, or lecture. And you're also welcome to share your ideas for upcoming happy hour lectures. There will be a question and answer session at the end, and you may submit your questions via the chat module. You may also identify yourself and your branch if you would like. Uh, you can also add comments as Dr. Phil Williams would like you to comment throughout, and we will read those comments uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, you will be able to find the chat module at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you may submit these questions anytime during the presentation. However, we will read the questions or the comments uh, in the order that they have been received. Uh, today, I would like to say that we have over 173 members registered for the Port Wines presentation, and that's great. I would also like to give a big shout to the branches with the most registered members. And uh, those branches are the Charlottesville branch, yay, Central Florida and Greenwich. Uh, Dr. Phil Williams, uh, and finally, I'm going to introduce him. Dr. Phil Williams, president of the ESU Charlottesville branch, uh, who will share his expertise with us today about uh, all his knowledge about port wines. A little bit about Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams is an adjunct professor at the Institute of World Politics in Washington, DC. He also teaches at the International Relations Department of Koch, Koch University in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, he has worked in the Mediterranean and in Turkey extensively. Phil also worked in corporate finance on Wall Street. Dr. Williams recently published a book, Turkey and America, East and West, where the twain meet. He has also <laughs> authored many news articles about Turkey and its domestic and international affairs. Phil has been an ESU member for over 23 years and has provided branch programming for over 18 years. He has also been active in the ESU Shakespeare and TLAB programs for many years. He has presented the ESU US, he, he represented the ESU US in ceremonies in Istanbul, Turkey, when this branch was opened and when it was set up. So thank you, Phil. Phil is president of the ESU Charlottesville branch a second time, and he has been able to increase their branch membership uh, from 70 to about 126 members currently. Phil, take it away. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I, well, I just wanted to say uh, how pleased I am that you all could join me this afternoon. I'd like to begin by wishing you a happy new year to all of you across the fruited plain. In the context of my talk today, I use the word fruited advisedly. So um, this is a lot of fun to do live. It's a little bit more challenging, to say the least, uh, to do it by Zoom not having some of the interaction and commentary that I otherwise would have when I have done these things a few times uh, over the last dozen years or so. But anyway, I'm looking forward to this and I've surrounded myself with a lot of delicious props and I will share them uh, visually with you. But let me begin by talking very briefly about what the branch has been doing. As Claire Perrin noted in the last couple of years, uh, we have uh, raised the branch membership back up uh, to record height, actually uh, over 50% in two years. And I am supported by a very strong board and strong uh, committee chairs. 
Uh, it's been exciting to work with them and to, to uh, see the branch uh, doing uh, as well as it's doing. I can mention uh, just a couple of things in connection with our philanthropies. Uh, <clears throat> we were fortunate uh, to have the uh, runner-up, the second place uh, national finisher in the <clears throat> Shakespeare uh, contest. And uh, thanks to a grant from uh, a couple of our members, member and his wife, uh, <clears throat> we've been able to add prize monies uh, for the first, second, and third uh, winners for our branch uh, contest down here, which is terrific. So on the T-Lab side, uh, our, per, the applicant that we accepted three years ago, uh, because of COVID, we were finally, she was finally able to go uh, over to the UK and study. And uh, she went to Oxford and uh, she came back. She was she was thrilled. Uh, our our um, Shakespeare contest winner just thrilled. And I encourage you to visit the Charlottesville website. We've expanded it a lot, um, lots, a lot more content in it and stories. And there are uh, testimonials from both the Shakespeare winner and from our, our T Lab person. Now, we had a, an extraordinary gift uh, given to us by a member last fall. And that has allowed us to expand our T-Lab <clears throat> reach. Uh, it was all our branch could do for many, many years to raise the money to send a teacher every other year. Uh, we can now quite comfortably send two teachers um, every year uh, with the grant that we uh, received last fall. So that's terrific. Uh, if there were three people uh, that were outstanding, uh, we could swing that as well. So that's a great new dimension uh, here, at the Charlottesville branch. So uh, that's enough for the promo about the Charlottesville branch, uh, but I couldn't do it uh, without a strong board and committee members. They've just been terrific. So let, let me just go on now and share you, uh, with you a little bit about um, my port story. How did I get interested in this uh, to begin with? I would say it was in the 1970s, grad school, in my mid to late 20s, uh, there was a very good wine store in Cambridge. I had already become quite interested and serious about wine and cooking both um, at that point. And uh, they had a terrific collection of ports and I began to sample them, became fascinated with them. Fast forward. Uh, 1985, uh, 15 months after baby one arrived, and a few months before our baby two arrived, uh, Marilyn and I took a trip to Portugal. And we had uh, visited in a number of places, but uh, I was had really targeted Oporto itself. And I went and we were in, it was in March, there were I mean, no tourists to speak of that we could even tell. Uh, and we went to the Taylor Fladgate, which uh, factory uh, or port lodge, which, uh, and I was particularly fond of, of their ports, uh, both uh, Tony and their vintage, and um, introduced myself. And lo and behold, we met the general manager who had a quintessentially wonderful British name. By the, he was Jeremy Bull. And he invited us in, and before we were through, we tasted seven vintage ports uh, going back to 1935. This is 1985. But then we were invited to lunch uh, in, the, in the lodge in his quarters. And uh, I think this is a point in which I think those of you that haven't already started should now join me because I'm going to start where I discovered, I wasn't aware of this, of white port. So I'm just going to add a little bit of what was recommended to me there. I have a nice cold white port here uh, with an orange in it. You could do it soda, quinine, or you can drink it straight. Uh, white port is actually made in uh, both dry, but more, more characteristically and typically 
uh, in uh, in a in a sweeter mode. So it's a wonderful summer drink. It, you have it chilled, have it on the ice, have it with your favorite fruits, or or have it neat as it were. Uh, so let me begin with uh, introducing White Port and saying to you all, cheers. I've discovered over the years that um, you might assume that white port was um, more of a lady's choice, but I, uh, over the years, having done this five or six times, maybe, uh, I find it quite a few men that enjoy uh, white port and white port cocktail. So I think at this point, uh, let's jump in uh, to the presentation. May we have the first slide? So by the way, feel free, um, as Karen said, if you have questions, uh, that's great. If you just like to comment on the wine, uh, or my descriptions of the wine, uh, or anything else, you can certainly leave a comment uh, there, and some of those will be shared, uh, I hope, during the Q&A. So you might agree with me, disagree with me, you might be crazy about something, feel free of, of these five styles of port feel free uh, to share your reactions and thoughts in the chat uh, in the chat room. So I open here with this classic poster from the 1930s, the Sandeman House. The Sandemans, uh, in fact, were primarily a Scots family who uh, became involved <clears throat> uh, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, uh, in the in the port business, port and sherry, and this is a an iconic uh, poster. Next slide. So, how did port wine? How did it come to be known as the Englishman's wine? If you can see on your screen there, that lovely collection of things to eat and share with various ports, you say. It says a Portuguese creation, a British discovery, an American passion. So I forthrightly accept all of those. Uh, it's definitely uh, the American market uh, has has grown uh, substantially uh, in in recent decades, and the price uh, is reflecting that. It was a lot less expensive when uh, even inflation adjusted. Uh, when I started introducing myself to various ports. So when we say it's an Englishman's malt wine, uh, let me also bring uh, to your attention, uh, some of you have been to church or go to church and uh, have taken communion. And with the popularity of port wine carried around the globe uh, by the British, uh, it so happens that very, Typically, uh, communion wine in the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church uh, is uh, diluted port wine. So this, this Englishman's wine uh, is, uh, is a very interesting concept, and it, it happens over the 18th century. We'll talk about how it happens. <clears throat> Next slide. So the British uh, history uh, probably goes back as far as uh, crusaders, many of whom were second and third sons and under British primogeniture uh, rules, uh, they didn't have much to look forward to in returning home. And it turned out that um, a, few, uh, a few knights, a few squires, and a few well-armed, well-trained people could basically take command of various castles and ports along the Mediterranean. So uh, as the uh, Crusaders were forced out of, uh, forced out of, uh, out of um, Israel, Palestine, and um, eventually uh, 
Turkey, they moved to Malta, they moved to Rhodes and then to Malta, and they settled in various places on the Spanish coast, and they settled on the Portuguese coast. So you have, uh, you have uh, British people uh, occupying some of these uh, coastal towns on the way back uh, to England, and they, much, they preferred the weather where they settled to the weather in, in the UK. So you can see here from this history that it, between the 11th and 13th centuries, Crusaders essentially wrest control of Portugal from the Moors. Now those aren't, that's not King Richard and the people that uh, went to the Near East and the Holy Lands. Uh, these are uh, ba basically French and Spanish people who fought to regain control of the Iberian Peninsula, which had been lost to the Moors uh, pretty much from the early eighth century for a period of uh, 600 uh, years or so. Uh, their strength was uh, decreasing already by 1070, but uh, it's during that period that the Moors are eventually pushed out and crusaders and uh, other Christians uh, regain control of these areas. And by 1373, uh, England signs its oldest treaty uh, of friendship uh, with Portugal. Winston Churchill would call on that treaty together with the 1654 treaty you see below uh, and basically announce to the King of Portugal during World War II, who was trying desperately to remain neutral uh, during the war, uh, announced to them that uh, by virtue of that treaty, treaty the British Navy uh, has every right to uh, coal its naval fleet uh, in the Azores, which were owned by uh, Portugal. So it was a, a bit problematic uh, for the king, but um, Churchill was determined and the British used, you know, probably only Winston Churchill would know that there was a treaty going back to the 14th century that he could activate uh, for the purposes of uh, winning a war. You can see in 1474, there are already records that attest to the lively uh, sales of what they called Portugal Red to England. By 1703, it's the beginning of the story of how port becomes the Englishman's wine. Uh, the, I don't need to tell English-speaking Union uh, members uh, and guests that the uh, love-hate relationship between the English, the British, and the uh, French is um, about a thousand years, uh, was it probably a thousand years old or older. And uh, th this particular time, uh, England went to war with Spain uh, over the Spanish uh, succession. And they ended up placing a 33% duty on claret, that is on Bordeaux wines, which in due course uh, made the, the, the Portugal red sales begin to grow dramatically, especially amongst the Whigs. Some Tories and some Catholics uh, who could afford it uh, continued uh, to drink claret, uh, but decade by decade, uh, taste, sh tastes shifted uh, to Portugal red. By the way, it was not fortified at that time. It was just red Portuguese, red Portuguese wine from the Douro Valley, uh, at the foot of which is the city of Oporto uh, on the Atlantic. The next uh, big uh, relationship uh, interface between the British and Portugal uh, is uh, occasioned by the war with Napoleon. Uh, and by 1805, you can see Lord Nelson has this stunning victory over the French fleet, the Battle of Trafalgar. And in 1806, uh, France, Napo under Napoleon's lead, invades Spain and Portugal uh, the, and commences what's known as the Peninsular War, that is the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which is Spain and Portugal. By 1812, Sir Arthur Wellesley, later dubbed Lord Wellington, boots the French out. But, uh, but 
while they were in Portugal and before they were able to move over the mountains successfully into Spain, uh, they first had, uh, the troops had firsthand experience of, uh, of port wine. Again, probably the vast majority of what they had was unfortified, that is with not uh, no brandy added, but they uh, developed a further fondness uh, for Portuguese wine, rather like the Doughboys did for French wine in World War I, and uh, people who fought uh, uh, coming up from Africa in World War II uh, into Italy uh, became enamored of uh, Chianti and Italian wines. Same thing happened to the troops here. Uh, I will tell you that while I was having lunch uh, with Jer Marilyn and I were having lunch with Jeremy Bull, being introduced uh, to chilled white port uh, with tonic, we also discovered that um, salty things go well with white port, but not so well with red. So we had, what did he give us before our lunch? He gave us green Spanish olives. And essentially English crisps. I have here represented as an American kettle chip. So the saltiness um, classically goes with the white pork. And while having lunch, I reached and pulled a dusty volume off this wall-to-wall -wall library shelves. And these were the quartermaster records <clears throat> of Wellington's uh, troops in, in Portugal. I happened to flip the page open and the soldiers were being reminded that they were guests in the country of Portugal and to desist from taking advantage of uh, young Portuguese women and to try to control, control their thirst for Portuguese wine. So it was quite a lunch, quite a conversation, uh, quite an opportunity for us that it sort of boosted our level of involvement with port. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, the British forces getting over the top of the mountains at the top of uh, the, where the Douro River, actually the watershed is in Spain. And they get over the mountains, begin to defeat Napoleon's troops uh, famously at the Battle of Salamanca in 1812. Next slide. So, Port Wine. Duro River Valley. Where are these, where do the names come from? What, what, what are they? Uh, Porto is basically a name from the Roman name. The Romans called it Port, <coughs> Porto Cale in the fourth century AD. They were the ones that introduced uh, vines uh, into the Duro River Valley, planting of viticulture. Uh, the Romans were responsible for that. And the river <clears throat> uh, Duro uh, is about 475 miles long, going up uh, from the Atlantic uh, into Spain. And <clears throat> the Duro is basically thought to probably be a, a of Celtic uh, origin, the name, and it's uh, similar to uh, Dover on Dour in England. So Dover on Dour and Douro were probably Celtic words that the uh, Romans uh, discovered when they got there, that th this is what the local people called it. Now, if you look at that river <clears throat> from Porto, um, the lodges uh, and uh, the port wine trade takes place opposite from the main urban city of uh, Porto, Oporto. Uh, it takes place on the other side of the mouth of the river. 
in Villa Nova de Gaia. Funny story about that, how that happened, but uh, it was originally all the business was in Porto and the Catholic Church uh, was involved in collecting certain revenues associated with the trade. Uh, but then it was decided that uh, the it would be terrific if all these factories and lodges uh, <clears throat> were moved out of the central city, uh, much to the dismay of the Catholic Church, because they no longer were able to collect revenues. But the city was able to move the working side of the of the trade and business to the other side of the mouth of the river. One needs to travel about 60 miles upstream, as it were, to the east uh, to get to <clears throat> uh, to get to the actual Duro Valley. And one needs to go there. The, the river is divided in the uh, Baya and Sima and Alto Corgo. It's the lower, the middle, and the upper reaches of the Duro River. Uh, the higher up you go on the river, the higher the uh, elevation, the hotter uh, the soil, <clears throat> the hotter the soil gets, and um, the finer uh, wines. The wine area begins uh, in uh, on the map at Regua or La Mego, uh, sort of central part of the uh, Sima or middle. Uh, part of the river is it Pinao, P I N H A O, you see there. And as you move up into the Alto Doro, uh, you get uh, into uh, some of the finer wines or vineyards, uh, which are called quintas. So, that next slide. So you can just take a look at this. The better the average incline uh, for the terraces for port wine <clears throat> is about 30 degrees. That is very steep. All those terraces and originally walls were done by hand um, until the early 1800s. Be able be began to be able to move some steam equipment in there, and to begin to cut some of those terraces. The work. Uh, next slide. The work is backbreaking, uh, as you see from this quotation here, from the Quinta de San Antonio's Armando Almeida. Uh, what he has to say about the conditions under which they struggle uh, to produce great wine here. The soil has uh, schist or schistos in it, and it's basically uh, set vertically, not horizontally. So cutting down, cutting it down to cultivate and to plant is cutting essentially into ver vertical rock. But the vertical rock, the schist, is a blessing on the other hand, because when the vines uh, start to lay down their roots, their roots go down these vertical schist uh, plates, and they grow very deep in the soil. And therefore, when it seems hot and dry and uh, grapes uh, should be dying on the vine, it's so hot and so dry, uh, the vines ha have grown, uh, the roots grow very deeply on these terraces, and they maintain uh, contact with uh, subsurface water uh, to keep them going. As I say, the higher up you go, the quintas, the vineyards higher up, uh, are higher elevations, uh, get hotter, drier, lower rainfall, more intense wines. Next slide. So the point I'm making here, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, strategic commodities such as wool, cod, caviar, cotton, sugar, rum, or oil uh, bring trade patterns with them, extraordinary cultural exchange, and sometimes conflict and war, probably more than sometimes. Port, is no, port wine is no exception. 
So how did port rather than claret become a matter of patriotism for many English? Next slide. Well, here you can see Jonathan Swift, uh, this great lexicographer and writer, uh, a little ditty here. And you can see how he's basically saying, this is, uh, the Treaty of Methuen kicks in in 1703. So 1710, 20, and 30, Jonathan Swift is writing. And he's basically saying, you know, um, you'd be more patriotic if you would support wines from Portugal than wines coming from our enemy of France. Be sometimes to your country true, have once the public good in view. Bravely despise champagne at court and choose to dine at home with port. Um, a, a, a clear Whig sentiment, to be sure. But then again, the, the, the Scots have always maintained, as you know, a special relationship with the uh, French. It took a little bit longer for the uh, Catholic Church to be completely displaced uh, <clears throat> by the Protestant Church and Church of England, etc. Uh, so you can see the, the, the next slide will give you the Scottish take on the same subject. Next slide. So to this, what this shows you is that uh, the, there was not a uniform preference through the British Isles uh, to uh, make the French pay and to and and to to be patriotic would mean mean to drink uh, port wine, stay at home, and and no, not be extravagant. But it was certainly uh, the Whig party sentiment uh, at that time, and that price difference over the course of a hundred years finally brings us to port being referred to as the Englishman's wine. Next slide. The great lexicographer Samuel Johnson, notes on rank ordering spirits. I'll let you read it for yourself. The happy compromise in the case of port, um, as you will see when I discuss how it's actually made today and how it's been made for uh, primarily since the 1820s, a more uniformly fortified uh, drink rather than just plain Portuguese uh, red wine or white wine. So the nice thing about port, of course, is that it is like sherry and like Madeira. It's the best of both worlds. It's grape juice fermented uh, uh, to which the, the fermentation is stopped uh, before, uh, all, before all of the residual sugar is gone in the grape, leaving some residual sweetness. It is stopped happily by grape brandy. So drinking port actually allows you to accomplish both objectives. Next. So here are the, the basic varietals. There, there are lots of varieties of grapes there, but primarily uh, the better wines are made with the varietals I've noted here. And that fortification was well established by the early 1800s, um, including Sherry and Madeira. Uh, to some extent, it was discovered by accident. The wines in general for shipping uh, in the 18th century Sometimes to stabilize the wine, brandy would be poured on top of the cask uh, as it was just before it was loaded into the hull of a ship. Uh, it, these uh, bogs heads that the wine was transported in uh, were used as ballast uh, in the ship going one way and the more, as you sold off the wine from port to port, uh, like the British East India Company tr trading all the way uh, out to India and back again, for example, uh, you would simply have to replace those uh, hogsheads with stone for ballast. 
But you can see here that uh, how uh, a pipe, by the way, is that's about 145 gallons. So you can see how the growth of this Portugal red wine uh, eventually begins to take off uh, by the late 19th century. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I've told you here, these uh, the grapes are uh, are transported down the Duro from the Quintas in the middle and upper reaches of the Duro, um, death-defyingly in these ships that you see that were traditionally used before uh, the advent of train alongside the river and now roadways. Uh, they're called uh, Barco Ravelos, and any number of uh, people lost their lives. Um, uh, in the cataracts at various levels as you uh, came uh, down the river towards the mouth from the upper reaches of the river. Uh, port was lost, people were lost. In fact, the um, white port that I'm drinking tonight is called Ferreira. Ferreira uh, is the name of uh, the surname, uh, married surname of uh, Antonia. Dona Antonio Ferreira, uh, who uh, was uh, married into a one of the porthouse lodge owners, families, port producers and shippers. Um, and she is pretty much a 19th century character by the mid 19th century. Uh, she'd gone through two husbands and then uh, married, uh, she married the the second husband was the wealthiest man in Portugal, which helped their business dramatically. And then he died. She married her uh, vineyard manager and was an extraordinary influence uh, on the port wine trade. And uh, she is Dona uh, Ferreira. And so here these, these wines are being shipped down the Duro. Uh, the grapes are. They're brought into the lodges. In the old days, uh, they were all uh, crushed underfoot in lagarish, is what they're called in these cement vats. Uh, it, today, the, uh, they are crushed with machines with the exception of vintage ports. The best vintage ports are still done by this traditional method. It takes two or three days. Uh, these people have to be fed uh, and they they keep they tread and they tread and they tread and they tread and some get out and uh, others go in and they drink until they're ready to fall in into the uh, juice and they get out and they're replaced but it's a very labor intensive process but it's still considered uh, the best process now how do you make a fortified port as I say shipping had they have put port on the top of Hogshead, probably back in the, in the 1600s, sometimes it's just stabilized the wine. In this case, the brandy is actually infused into the grape juice. And it's four parts to one part brandy. If you allowed the grapes to completely ferment uh, out at 14 or 15%, uh, the, the wine would be dry. You arrest the fermentation of the grape juice by introducing 77% uh, grape brandy alcohol, which immediately stops the fermentation process. That's typically done when there are three or four or five, depending on the style of port you have, degrees of alcohol uh, that would have otherwise uh, turned from sugar to alcohol, it gets stopped, it gets arrested, so residual sweetness uh, is left uh, in the wine. That's a fortified wine, all of things being equal, the same as happens uh, to, uh, to Spanish sherry uh, and to Portuguese Madeira. That's how you stop fermentation 
preserve re residual uh, sugars and therefore sweetness. Is port wine sweet? Yes, sort of. I qualify because if it were just sweet, it would, it would never have become as popular and as expensive and as desirable uh, as it became. It, the, the better ports uh, have tannic acids in them plus tannins from wood in the, in the case of cask age ports uh, that create an acetic balance to that sugar so that there's nothing cloyingly sweet about Porto. Uh, although some people say uh, it's too sweet for me. But uh, there are horses for courses and there are times uh, when a slightly sweet wine that's beautifully balanced with acidity uh, can't be beat. Next slide. So we have the subject of wood ports here. So tonight I have for wood ports, these are wines that are basically kept in large wooden barrels, aged in the barrels. Uh, you can see the difference between a ruby and a tawny. Uh, tawny spend a little bit more time in wood, a little bit more time in wood than ruby. Ruby grapes are designed are picked from vineyards that have slow maturing grapes in, in fermentation, have very bright red color and are very fruit forward. So the, the, the wines, the, the grape varietals that are used to produce rubies, which are, again are blended different, at, uh, different age uh, is in the barrel, but they're generally speaking, three to four years in a barrel before bottled. And because the group, the grapes that are selected are fruit forward and bright in color, uh, they, they tend to keep that color uh, in the wine. Uh, the, the wine is a little sweeter, has a little less wood and tannic tannins uh, to counter that sweetness. Uh, greatly loved by many, as I have here for the tastings, uh, I tend to uh, do ruby, ruby versus tawny, uh, because they're both they're both cask age wood ports. Rubies are younger, as I say. Have the the tawny port grape uh, doesn't have to be uh, is fruit forward. Uh, it can uh, mature more quickly because it's the interest there is to marry it more with the wood and you end up with a very different color and a different taste. The ruby, cherry, cherry fruits for sure, floral, um, white, uh, ripe plums, and the tawny. The tawny is 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 the gets its name for the color. It's mahogany. It's been in that wood much longer. Uh, it's closer uh, to brown, and uh, it it has that additional wood flavor, which lots of people lots of people like including me. And I happen to, all other things equal, I prefer tawny to ruby, but if you're cooking, ruby is the better wine for cooking. We can talk about that. How do you make a lovely uh, reduction uh, when you're serving a goose at Christmas, as I am wont to do uh, with dried fruits and the uh, goose renderings and goose uh, stock? Uh, fortified, as it were, with a, with port, and I do it with ruby port, not tawny. So I don't know what you have in front of you, because I can't tell.
Tawny. Less cherry, a little more dark fruit, a little caramel, a little toffee. These are the things that uh, come from that marriage, the longer marriage with the wood. Now, I should say that I won't be able to do it until after the presentation, but I have here um, a number of goodies. Uh, I can't really show them, but things to have with port in general. Uh, walnuts, not salted. Dried fruits like apricots. They're excellent. With tawny and with vintage, little mince pies, mince meat pies. You can't, you can't go wrong uh, with a late bottle vintage or vintage and chocolate. It just is a natural marriage. And then of course, quintessentially, I have here a blue vein cheese. Uh, you could use gorgonzola. It would be, it, it's also wonderful, but preferably an English Stilton. Marries beautifully with late bottle vintage and vintage. So let me move on. To the bottom, you see the late bottle vintage here is blended again, cask aged a little bit longer with wines from a particular year, but not quite a vintage quality. So sometimes their they're, they're decisions uh, about a year and a half after the uh, grapes are crushed, decisions are made as to whether or not the wines are of a quality to even produce vintage port. Some of the also rands are noted very close to being of that quality. So they're, they are watched over that four, five, six years and, in, uh, and are actually kept separate as though they were from a vintage. They're put in wood, but they are kept separately. And they are taken out, as it says here, five, six, seven years. They'll take that vintage-like wine, and it has the advantage of not having to decant it. It has the advantage of not having uh, to wait as long as one should wait for a vintage port as I'll explain later. So from a price standpoint, to get a vintage-like wine for a third of the price of a vintage wine, not have to fool with decanting, uh, not having to wait forever, late bottle vintage uh, commercially has proven uh, very successful, but it's literally that. It's a wine that doesn't quite make the grade for vintage, not every year uh, does Portugal produce wines of a quality to call them vintages. Sometimes the vintages are so obviously terrific, they are universally declared by all the port houses. Sometimes there are different producers, uh, Taylor, Fladget, Fonseca, Sandeman, Grams, somebody that says that their grape juice is of vintage quality even if everybody else is, is not, so obviously so. So you'll find some years where vintage wines are produced by a, 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 a real minority of the port houses, but they believe that their wine was exceptional, even though the average wine was not exceptional from that year. So next slide. So the invention of the glass bottle that could be laid on its side for slow aging. A secret largely lost to Europe since the Falernian, so appreciated by Horace in Rome, as I say. Yeah, the 1600s, uh, they start producing uh, glass bottles. Uh, you would probably know them by, by the term flagon. Uh, and they were not, uh, they were, were fat bottomed. Uh, and were not intended uh, to store 
wine, you know, for long periods of time. With the invention of uh, the perfectly cylindrical bottle with a narrow neck and the discovery of uh, cork and uh, long cork in the case of port or other wines that are expected to be aged for a very long period of time have slightly longer corks. It was discovered that these wines could become brilliant, but they had to be left on their sides for considerable periods of time while they would mature ever so slowly through the tiniest amounts of air that would get through a cork. The liquid couldn't get through it, but air would. They would age and they could be laid down. This was the big development in the 1700s, which eventually lent itself uh, very famously uh, to Champagne, where, it was, uh, where they had learned how to make glass that was stronger, that could deal with the gas inside the Champagne, uh, but where they could, uh, with, with nice corks, properly uh, pla pla uh, placed corks, you could lay a, a wine down, a vintage port down, or any other great red wine with serious body, tannic acid, aging capacity, you could lay them down. This uh, lent itself very well uh, to the uh, evolution of uh, literally brilliant uh, vintage ports. Uh, but you will see here, it normally would take, um, well, uh, the rule of thumb is uh, 18 years. That's a long time to wait, which is why Tawny ports, Ruby ports, and late bottle vintage ports are less expensive uh, and more popular and uh, more widely sold. As you can see at the bottom, uh, only about 3% of the crop uh, produces a juice that is considered adequate, adequate to be claimed uh, to be vintage. Next slide. Uh, and then there are single, there are hybrids here that for, uh, again, for I would say mostly for commercial purposes. Um, I, for commercial purposes, I would, I would say that these are created uh, to, to find little places in the interstices of market demand uh, to meet uh, particular uh, taste and uh, cost preferences. So a single quinta, is a wine that the uh, wine is made from the grapes of, of one vineyard only. I happen to have a beautiful bottle of uh, 1992 single quinta uh, Guaymarans uh, vi uh, vintage port. Then crusted port, poor man's port two years in the oak, then bottled, ready to drink after five or six years of bottle aging. You don't put the best of your uh, juice uh, into these bottles. So you get a little bit of wood. They're probably pretty fruit forward and put them in a bottle and sell about five or six years and hence the name poor man's port. Uh, Colheta means it comes from a particular harvest. That is a particular year, uh, aged in wood seven or more years, with characteristics of tawny. Bottles should have two dates, both the harvest and the bottling years on them. That's colheta. And then you have another variation here, reserve ports, which are a blend of premium quality wine aged in wood for seven or more years, but has no date. So it's, it's not quite as good as a late bottle vintage where you've actually tracked, it's not a blend. You've actually put juice that didn't quite qualify for vintage, but you put it and kept it separately. And you decide at the end of five or six years that it's, it's so good that you're gonna take it out of wood so there, um, and uh, put it in a bottle. That's a late bottle vintage. Reserve port is similar, little, little less expensive, because of the qualifications I note here. Next, next slide. So here they are on your screen, beginning with white port, uh, <clears throat> ruby, tawny, late bottle, and vintage. Next slide. 
So there are traditions in serving uh, these wines. Uh, many of them come from the English Navy. And um, the, the port gets poured. Here's my 1820, 1830, 1840 three ring uh, antique port decanter. Uh, it gets passed in a clockwise fashion. And <clears throat> so I don't know if any of you have late bottle vintage or vintage uh, that you're drinking today, but I think when you put them up, it will be only be the vintage that goes into that decanter. The late bottle vintage not needing to be decanted. Late bottle vintage is very dark looking, but not as dark and not as intense as the vintage. Heavenly, divine. Next slide. You know that when you pass these decanters around a table, sometimes uh, it takes a long time, uh, especially if people pour their own glasses. Others to your left have finished theirs and you get involved in a lot of conversation and you fail to pass the decanter. So the expression there is, uh, sir, the ship is very long, meaning please move the port. Or, or an even funnier one, my good sir, do you know the Bishop of Norwich? The Bishop of Norwich was a bishop in the first half of the 19th century. As he got older, of course, he would be invited by his parishioners uh, to, from lunch, and they would sit afterwards and, and have port. And the older he got, uh, the, the slower he was about moving the port uh, around the table, so much so that uh, he was uh, in his dotage, he was known to nod off with the decanter sitting in front of him. So if you're hogging the port and you don't move it, sometimes the question is, do you know the Bishop of Norwich? Next slide. Port and family traditions. Laying down ports for one's children at their birth generally not to be open before their 18th birthday. The 1980s produced two universally declared vintages, 1983 and 1985. Only two were universally declared. Just read the last thing on this slide there, and you will understand why Marilyn and I laid down a case of each of 83 and 85 uh, for our children. We have had more fun, and I will tell you that they watched, by the time they were 12 years old, 13, they were watching me decant at Christmas or Thanksgiving. Uh, they know how to properly uh, decant or salvage a wine where the cork breaks up and so forth and so on. But the cute story I'll tell you very quickly is that when Margaret turned 18, we uh, opened her 1983 vintage port, Taylor Fladgett. Two years later, Phillips turned 18, and we opened the 1985 Grams. Both were said to be the best of their year. One year later, the children came home at Christmas and said, Dad, we want to taste off. He said, I am, my daughter said, I know my 83 is better than my brother's 85. And, they, and he said, no way. So we carefully decanted these things early Christmas morning. Uh, we checked on them in the afternoon. Uh, we enjoyed them uh, with Stilton cheese uh, at, at dessert time and kept a little oat for the following morning to see if, uh, make sure we had given uh, full judgment uh, and fair judgment to each. Uh, the agreement the following morning, the day after Christmas, is that it was a tie. Next slide. 
So yeah, there's ports, port for medicinal purposes. Next slide. Here you use Sandeman Port marketing in the 1930s. This is the Scottish firm. There, you can read it. Next slide. And then there's drinking port, a uh, little bit beyond uh, the med medicinal usage here. Um, you see here in Polgarth. It, it may not be addressing issues of health, uh, but pro quite possibly, arguably, was helping uh, the, the soul. Next slide. So here are some port fanciers of note, Dr. Samuel Johnson. Uh, you can see the amounts in the good old days that these people uh, consumed regularly. I'll just let you read them. Next slide. So here's some special vintages. Um, to th the, currently, um, the youngest highly touted vintage is 2017. So you could put, put one of these down for a grandchild, uh, for example. Uh, going back in time, uh, those were very special vintages, and you can see our children's birth years in them, the 85s and 83s. Uh, classics were 1954, 1904, 1900, and maybe the best 1927 in the Roaring Twenties. What happened? Well, people didn't know this because by the time the, the wine was declared a vintage, uh, was uh, removed from the cask and uh, put into bottle and got to market, we were in the midst of the depression. So people only discovered many, many years later, most generally speaking, uh, after World War II, they discovered that the 27 was fabulous. And the last one here is the Waterloo port of 1815, uh, which as I say, uh, at the bicentennial in 2015 recently, Sotheby's auctioned a Ferreira, I told you about her, at the Tower of London for 6,800 euros. It was noted that no French were present. Next, how long can a port be kept? Here's what Wyndham Fletcher, I think it's my favorite single book, Wyndham Fletcher's classic book. I mean, it was published in the mid seventies, but it's a fabulous book about port, the families, the wine, how it was made, the history, the great characters and so forth. So he basically says, you know, if you, if, if you lay it down, a great port, when you're born, it'll see you out. So properly aged, carefully aged, ports can go a very long time. The oldest one in my cellar right now is 1970. Next. So in victory, you deserve ports. In defeat, you need it. I thank you all so much for sharing a passion of mine, history, politics, war, and a fabulous wine that becomes even more beautifully developed uh, with the um, introduction of fortification, making it a stable, elegant, extraordinary, highly prized wines. Thank you all. Cheers again and Happy New Year. Mm, that's a wrap. Okay, let's get to some of the questions here for. Uh, you, Phil. Uh, the first one is from uh, M. Wang, and uh, they asked, which are your favorite labels now in the duo region, particularly from smaller vineyards? Um, 
Well, if you're actually talking about just a vineyard, then you're actually talking about an individual quinta. Yeah, the, the Douro region they're asking about. No, the Douro region is what we're talking about today. Yeah. Okay, so right. the answer is this if uh, it's very difficult. Uh, Vesuvio, Guayamarans uh, are two single quinta, single vineyard uh, ports, uh, which historically have been absolutely outstanding and elegant. So my answer is, here's an example of two. The Guayamarans and Vesuvio uh, are two single quinta, duro, uh, single vineyard, uh, vintage ports. Okay, uh, the next question is from Charles Lumpkins from the Central Pennsylvania branch. Uh, he asked, is brandy the only substance that best fortifies port? Were other alcoholic and non-alcoholic substances experimented as fortifying agents? Uh, I, I couldn't uh, authoritatively answer that. My understanding is that, uh, that grape brandies from grape producing uh, this is not Germany or, or, or Canada. We're not producing grain whiskeys or Scotland. So the, the grains uh, that are made from wheat and rye and so forth, as far as I know, were never ever used or introduced uh, into the Duro, into the making of port wine. What they had was distilled uh, fermented grape juice, otherwise known as grape brandy. It, which in France, of course, uh, is is cognac, and can only be uh, if it, it must be for cognac to be called cognac. But it is a brandy. Grape brandies are, are used all over the world, all over the Mediterranean. Uh, to okay, make go ahead. Okay. Uh, all right, Jim Noon asks, "Who decides a port is? Who decides is a port is vintage?" How long will a port hold its quality after it has been opened? Okay, good, good questions. Uh, it's there is a, a council of the of the leading houses. There's an association of the factory of, of port makers, and they sit down uh, in the spring and summer, the second year after uh, the wine has been. Uh, harvested and juice uh, put in uh, barrels, and they decide whether the quality of the wine, the conditions, and whether uh, it's universally was a fabulous year. One usually knows by the weather. You know, late frosts would kill things. Uh, too much rain would make uh, wines less than uh, vintage quality. Uh, so they sit down and they decide as, as a group, uh, the, the Port Lodge uh, Council. Uh, how long uh, can uh, vintage go un, unopened and still retain its quality? Uh, after you've opened it, I would say, uh, I would say after three days, you begin to see some diminution, uh, but it, it's five or six days, it's still uh, a beautiful wine. Um, this, for example, um, I opened because I wanted to monitor it and watch it. I opened this on Saturday. This vintage uh, here, uh, which is uh, a 1992 Fonseca. Fonseca is particularly well known. Although they make nice tawnies, they're particularly well known uh, for their vintage ports. And uh, the 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 fruitiness and the bouquet uh, and the richness of the plumminess and of of this wine uh, is it's one of those houses that's famous for making particularly famous for making vintage ports. Okay, uh, James Badley uh, mentions he states fabulous and informative presentation, Phil, and there's one more. Uh, on the uh, chat for you, how long will an open vintage or tawny last? Well, you've already pretty much said that. Well, said no, that no, no. The open. second question is tawny. Tawny, so, yeah. How long will yeah. that last so on the shelf? Wood, wood, wood age ports, uh, wood age, wood ports uh, on, the, on the shelf are going to last forever in a bottle. They're going to last forever. 
And when you open them, they're largely terrific for a couple of months, you know, on your sideboard, like, like a very good sherry. Uh, you know, six months you don't want to do, but a couple of months, it, it, they're going to hold up beautifully uh, because of the tannic uh, acid level uh, of all that wood that's been imparted into the grape juice. <laughs> okay, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, I've given everybody a chance to ask ask their questions, Phil. There were a couple others from Charles Lumpkins, but uh, we're uh, we're at about uh, six yeah. fifteen, and uh, I'm going to now uh, introduce Karen Karperwitz, our executive director, who will uh, have some comments, and we'll do our uh, closing closing comments and remarks. Thank you, thank you, Phil. Anyway, thank you. thank you so much, Phil. It was fascinating. And thank you so much also for the update on the uh, Charlottesville branch. It sounds like some exciting things are going on. And that's not to, that's nice to share with everyone to know what's going on there. Thank you again. And Karen, uh, thank you and the, the committee again for uh, creating a wonderful presentation. I also want to thank two of our new producers this, this month. I mean, we have uh, Stefan Lebron and also... Uh, Tony DeFilippo, who's produced this event this evening, and I want to thank them. This is their, their maiden voyage, and I think they did a wonderful job. Thank you again. Um, I hope to see you all on February 1st, when we're going to be talking about Moby Dick, or the weird Moby Dick, at 4 o'clock, and uh, with Hilary Blum, who is the former uh, head of the uh, Herman Melville Society. So it sounds fascinating and interesting, and a little bit of a turn from what we talked about this evening. But thank you again, and Happy New Year, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.